My guest at this time is Barbara Franklin. She's the president and CEO of Barbara Franklin Enterprises, and she also served as the Secretary of Commerce for President George H.W. Bush. In that role, she was very much involved in the negotiations for the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA. During the 2016 campaign and since taking office, President Trump has uh, very much desired to renegotiate it. And he says if he didn't get uh, a new agreement to his liking, he would scrap it altogether. Now he's very proud of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which some people are calling NAFTA 2.0. But uh, for the next few minutes, we'll talk to Barbara and see what's different, what's not, and what it means for us going forward. And Barbara, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Delighted to be with you, Greg. Well, this is a story that's obviously gotten uh, swallowed up in the news cycle a little bit here. But as you look at the deal and what we know about it so far, and it still, of course, has to be ratified by all three nations, uh, what do you see as the key similarities in what's being proposed and the key differences with what you helped to put together with NAFTA? Well, the first thing I want to say about this is that I'm delighted that this negotiation is now done because I think the process of it was unsettling to investors, businesses, consumers, uh, and some of the rhetoric surrounding it was not real helpful. So I think it's a good thing that, uh, that we've got this done. And uh, I, although I feel that NAFTA played its part very well for the last 25 years, it's probably a good idea to revise and modernize trade agreements uh, over uh, some period of time. So uh, that's the way I am viewing this. Uh, the most significant parts of this agreement have to do with the auto sector and with dairy. And some trade-offs were made, as is always true in negotiations like this. Uh, Canada agreed to open its dairy market by eliminating some of the quotas and the pricing system that has been in place and was problematic for our U.S. side dairy farmers. So hopefully our dairy farmers will be able to, to send more butter, milk, and cheese to Canada under this agreement. And on the U.S. side, uh, we agreed to keep Chapters 19 and 20 of NAFTA, which are the dispute settlement mechanisms, and that has to do with anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases, of which we've had a bunch of those over the years with Canada, softwood lumber being one of the key issues. And under this mechanism, it means that disputes can be solved uh, by independent, by national panels, in other words, of the, the two countries' panels together, rather than going through the U.S. judicial process having to do with anti-dumping and countervailing duty, which is, I would have to say, that's, get, that's run out of the Commerce Department. That's, that's a kind of a heavy-duty, lengthy process. So Canada insisted on keeping this. So that's one trade-off that was made. Now, autos are another key part of this, um, and, and this is interesting, I think. We'll have to see, I think, uh, whether this remains, uh, North America remains competitive as we would like in, in the auto business. But it requires that duty-free cars that, of course, move beyond back and forth over our borders, they, they have to have 75% of the content of them produced in North America and 40% of the content to be made by $16 an hour labor. Now, the $16 an hour labor um, I think probably is in there to to get the backing of uh, of unions here uh, w with respect to the uh, the agreement. But I have heard from a representative in Mexico that Mexico can't possibly get there in terms of, of sixteen dollars an hour. So where all this comes out in terms of where autos and parts are made and how they come together, I think is something. That, uh, that yet remains to be seen. You mentioned the dispute resolution. That was uh, believed to be a major concession by the Trump administration. They did not want to keep that provision at all. Ultimately, they did as part of the negotiation, as you explained. Uh, so how right. big of a concession is that? Well, I, I, I think, frankly, I think it's the right thing to do. <laughs> um, I think that dispute settlement mechanism has been working well over the last 25 years. And, you know, when something does work well, let's not, uh, let's not throw it out. 
So I think that that was, uh, frankly, a, a, a good thing. If you have to make concessions, that was a good one to do. And I think it was a real sticking point for Canada. Um, I, I really believe Canada may have just walked away if, uh, if they hadn't been able to keep this. So I think this came out just fine, uh, that particular trade-off. You know, there were a couple of, uh, of new sections put into this agreement that I, I view it as modernizing, frankly. Uh, they've put uh, uh, some verbiage in there about, uh, about di digital commerce. Right. Now, you know, there wasn't digital commerce to speak of in any volume when NAFTA was negotiated. So I think that makes sense. Uh, there's some stuff about financial services and intellectual property that I also view as a modernization. <clears throat> and all of that's a good thing. The, the, um, the sunset provision that's in there, and I know the administration started out wanting to, to, uh, to sunset in five years, I believe it was. Well, it's now a 16-year uh, provision with a, a review period every six years. And, you know, I guess that's, uh, that's okay. We'll have to see how it works. I do think it's wise to look at trade agreements every so often. Not too often. You have to give them a chance to work. But just to make sure that, that they are as modern and, and up-to-date as they should be. And as you said, uh, the next steps, it must be signed. The agreement must be signed by the three heads of state, uh, our president, Canada's prime minister, Mexico's current president, and they are focusing on getting that done before November 30th because the new Mexican president, Lopez, Lopez Obrador, takes office December 1. And really the president, Peña, uh, under whose jurisdiction this was negotiated, really needs to sign this. And then the Congress uh, has to act. Uh, well, the ha that has to happen in, in all three countries. But... Uh, the Congress will act on the implementing uh, regulations that are put forth by the Trump administration, and I think that's now going to land in next year. And what, uh, where that comes out here, given that we have midterm elections and there could be some changes in the Congress, I, I'm not about to predict anything, but I'm just saying it's, this is something, um, something to keep, keep an eye on as to where this, uh, where, where this goes. We're talking with former U.S. Secretary of Commerce Barbara Franklin. And, Barbara, a couple more questions in our remaining time here. Uh, first of all, you mentioned uh, the $16 an hour wage, and I believe there's another provision about a certain percentage of the parts being have to be made in the, in the three countries involved, or maybe even in the United States. And obviously that's good for U.S. manufacturing. You mentioned how it would be uh, attractive to the unions and so forth. Other folks are worried that it's going to make products more expensive. Can you talk to that a little bit? Uh, I have heard that concern. Um, really, that's, that's speaking to the impact of this agreement on consumers. And I'm not sure I can comment on it because I really don't know how this is going to pan out. But I think it, there is a question uh, about that. And I'm not sure I've, I've uh, seen anything very definitive so far, and we probably won't know until the thing is, is in effect and we see what the impact on, on the pricing is. And on, in the automobile sector is the one you were talking about there. It really has to do with supply chain and, and which parts are made where and how all of that comes together. But 75% of the content of any duty-free cars uh, must be North American produced. And that's a, new, that's a new wrinkle here. So I think we will have to see. Last question, Barbara, and you began your comments uh, in our conversation here by saying that a lot of people are relieved that there actually is a deal. We weren't sure if Canada was going to be part of it. We weren't sure that there was going to be any deal uh, until fairly recently. Uh, and so there's been some concern and, and upheaval about the approach to renegotiating this and other trade deals and the administration's general approach to trade, especially with respect to China and so forth and the use of tariffs. Uh, a lot of uh, concern about that, uh, perhaps some Fears about uh, economic instability as a result of that. Uh, the president's defenders would say that he was able to make pretty good headway with the European Union on this issue recently. And even China has been making some concessions. So even though it's clearly unorthodox, are we ending up in a better spot than, than when, where we started? Well, you know, I certainly hope we're going to end up in a better <laughs> spot. 
But I, with, with all of these kinds of agreements, the, the proof is in the pudding. It's how it actually works. And there always are someone that's always doing an analysis of winners and losers. And there's always some of that thought process in here. And I think we're, we're just going to have to see. My hope always is that whatever we do stimulates more trade. Because I do believe that trade does help economic growth. And goodness knows we need it uh, all around the world. And we're doing quite handsomely here in the U.S., right now, but we need it all around the world, and that's, uh, that's one of the reasons I have always been a free trader and will always be a free trader, and so I'm, I'm just uh, quite hopeful that it works well this time. You know, this agreement, when, when you go back to the, your comment about Canada, the first really, I think, liberalizing trade agreement around the world was in 1987 between Canada and the U.S., it did away with tariffs. It covered services for the first time. It put dispute settlement settlements into the uh, the agreement, and then uh, then then came NAFTA in 1992, and that brought in Mexico. And now we have we have gone uh, another step forward in modernizing. Is the way I'm looking at this. We're modernizing agree, an agreement that was a pretty good one, and hopefully we have made it better. Fascinating to watch, and I'm sure we'll have uh, more to learn coming forward here. Barbara, thank you so much for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. Barbara Franklin is president and CEO of Barbara Franklin Enterprises. She served as Secretary of Commerce for President George H.W. Bush and was very actively involved in the negotiations that created the North American Free Trade Agreement. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for Radio America.